الله رب العالمين الحمد لله كما ينبغي لجلال وجهه وعظيم سلطانه الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد All praise is due to Allah the one who deserves to be praised. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly, wholeheartedly, sincerely. And we will bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Him. He has no partners. He has no children. And He is alone. He is one and He is unique in His oneness. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave. He is Allah's slave and Allah's messenger. We ask Allah to exalt His mention and grant Him peace and send His blessings and salutations upon Him and upon his companions and his wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. All you have believed, fear Allah and be mindful of him the way he deserves to be feared. And do not die except in the state of submission as Muslims. Brothers in faith, Muslims, submitters, believers, those who are looking forward to the life to come. We wished it was easy, but it's not. It's a challenge. It's an ongoing challenge that lasts from the time you come into this world until you depart. And it's not like it's a solo mission either. It's not a solo mission. You usually don't find yourself on an island on your own with no human beings and a masjid. So you spend your life praying, fasting, remembering Allah, and surviving until you die. I'm not aware of that happening to anybody. And if it did, it's insignificant. Because the rest of us don't have that. It's not a solo mission in a sense, that you have a certain responsibility towards people. And the responsibility you have towards people varies. They're not all at the same level. And it's not the same level of responsibility also. And from this member, we've addressed many of these responsibilities. The responsibility towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and towards the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and towards the Sahaba and towards our parents and we've spoken about the neighbors and we've addressed the matter of the family but today we would like to lay emphasis on the women who aren't present 
and I'm aware of that. But the actual message is not addressing the women. The message is to you, brothers, regarding your women. Meaning this is something that you have to do in regards to your women. And of course, in my case, towards my women. What I'm saying is they don't need to be present for the message to be delivered because you will be the one who will deliver the message and execute. You will execute because Allah gave us this responsibility. Allah gave us this responsibility in more than one occasion in the Quran. Men are in charge and responsible for women or of women. Because of how Allah favored one over the other in so many ways. And because of what men spent. You're the one who spends. You're supposed to be the one who spends. And the Prophet said to confirm this concept. Each one of you is a shepherd. And he will be asked about those, about his flock, about his sheep, about those under his care. The man is the shepherd regarding his household. And he will be asked about them. If you go to any mall, any mall today, you will have a hard time finding a single sister dressed appropriately. You will hardly find a single sister that is actually following the Islamic dress code that necessitates certain obligations on her. You will hardly find one. Rather, you will find the opposite of that. You will find creativity in disobedience. Creativity in adornment. Creativity in going against the modesty, which is the most fundamental trait of a Muslim woman. Modesty. And it is shameful for the sister and it is shameful for that man who's supposed to be in charge of her. Because how do you measure the manhood in certain aspects of the deed? This is definitely one of the KPIs. If you want to measure your manhood, that's one of the ways to identify. If a woman is under your care, if Allah decree that she's under your care, then what are you doing in terms of making sure she is in line with what is pleasing to Allah? Not necessarily by force, by speech, by admonishment, by education, by sharing knowledge with her, by connecting her with good sisters. There are a list of things that you ought to do. I'm not trying to call to aggressiveness or violence so you go home and start screaming at your wife that she needs to dress pro appropriately from now on, like you just woke up from a bad dream. Because if she doesn't have the foundation to implement, it will often lead to discourse, and then at some point they will, you will have a bigger problem than the existing one. Not that you're not allowed at some point to impose things. As a man, you impose. And as long as what you're saying is pleasing to Allah, then the women must comply. They must comply. Otherwise, she becomes in a state of nushus, a state of disobedience. And there's a list of Islamic rulings regarding such relationship. And how much, how patient you can be before you at some point have to let go of this woman.
Islam does not recommend, it does not endorse unhealthy relationships that are ongoing permanently for the sake of the children or for the sake of the people or for the sake of the reputation. It does not endorse that. That's why unlike Christianity, we have divorce. We have a surah in the Quran called at talaq divorce. Sometimes divorce is the solution. The Prophet ﷺ was on the verge of divorcing more than once. And according to some scholars, he did divorce some of the women. And so did the Sahaba. And those were the finest of people. Not that we're calling for that. Fundamentally, you want harmony and you want the people to be in synergy and get along. But if there's an issue, then there's a solution in Islam. But before we get to all of that, I don't want to shift or change the topics. You owe it to your wife or your daughter, or whoever you're in charge of, to explain to them what is the expectation in Islam? What are they expected to do? How they expected to carry themselves, behave and dress? It is on you, my brother. And don't say, I don't know. If you don't know, learn. Because I bet you, and betting is not a, a valid thing, it's an expression, I don't mean it in a literal sense. I challenge you, if I may use this term, that if you got a job, and then you missed a skill, and they told you either you will learn this skill, or we will fire you, you will learn this skill. And you probably won't even sleep at night to learn this skill. Because you need to keep a job. But suddenly you can't learn some rulings of Islam, often that have already been compiled and translated for you in the simplest words. It's all out there. It's not in Jupiter. It's on the internet. It's on websites, reliable, authentic, resourceful websites that break it down for you in your mother language, be it English or Tagalog or Urdu or whatever you speak, it is there. It is on you to learn and educate. It's on you to do that. Don't wait for the wife to do it. It's your job to do it. If she does it on her own, Jazakallah khairan. So where are we from that? And how does a man, how does a man find it okay with himself to have his wife by him, adorned, adorned and brothers, just because the culture, just because the culture is in favor of wearing a garment, a abaya over the clothes and some cloth on the head that doesn't constitute hijab in Islam. Just because she put something over her undergarment, her pants and shirt, whatever she's wearing, just some abaya that is loose and open in the middle and open on the top and some cloth that she wrapped around her head that she willingly and comfortably in front of the people removes to refix it. And in that moment when she removes it, her face, her neck, her hair, enjoying his hamburger like we are already in Jannah that is not hijab that is culture certain cultures wear more conservative more covering clothing and it doesn't count in the sight of Allah some of the Jews the women wear niqab but they're upon shirk. It's useless. Then a, a believer in Tawheed and the oneness of Allah is on the flip side of all of that. Why we have Allah and the Quran saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya ayyuhal Nabi, Qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'mineen yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihin thalika adna ayyu'arafna fala yudayin. O oh Prophet, tell your wives, your daughters, and the believing women to cover with the veil. Let them bring the veil closer to their bodies. Cover their complete bodies. 
This is more likely that they will be identified as respectful and respected women so they will not be harmed. And today, if a man wants to harass a woman, he will usually not be looking at the one that is dressed appropriately. He will be harassing the one that is already showing him more than he needs to see. And that's a given, I don't need to elaborate on that. What the scholars differ about in this ayah and the other ayah, which is وَخُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْدُطْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهْرَ مِنْهَا And then Allah broke it down until He said, and let them not stomp their feet so that it is heard, and I will go to that later. The other ayah, and tell the believing women to lower their gaze and to protect their private parts. And let them not show their adornment. Let them not reveal their adornment except that which appears thereof. And obviously that's the outer clothing. And the evidence that this is the outer clothing is that later on in the ayah, after Allah mentioned the maharim of the woman, He said, and let them not stomp their feet so that it is heard what they hide of their adornment. Because back then, the context of revelation of this ayah is women used to wear anklets. And you guys know what anklets are. Instead of a bracelet, it goes around the leg. And women used to wear them, and when they would walk, walk by the men, they would stomp their feet so that you hear the so sound of jewelry. And that for a man, that's enough imagination. That opens the door of imagination. And so Allah said, do not let them, don't stomp their feet so that it is heard what they are hiding of their jewelry. So hearing it for the man is not okay, let alone seeing it. Rings, bracelets, earrings, nose rings, everybody rocking contact lenses. You don't know who's Arab anymore and who's European. And who's uh, uh, Pakistani, who's Indian? Everybody got blue eyes. Changing everything. Nobody's happy with the way they are. That's cool. Let's assume that this is okay. You want to have blue eyes, green eyes, knock yourself out at home. We're back to the same thing. And by the way, I'm not discussing niqab. I am not discussing niqab. Niqab is the subject matter of difference of opinion among the scholars from the time of the Sahaba. I will, I personally, I personally, as per my limited knowledge and understanding of the deen and the textual evidences, I am of the opinion that covering the face is not obligatory. It's not obligatory. Even though I have my family wear niqab because to me it's more rewarding, it's a sunnah and it gives me a peace of mind because I'm a, I'm a jealous man. I don't want no Joe to be staring at my family while, I, while with me. So when she's covered, I can have a peace of mind. If he's sick, then that's another problem. I am not telling you right now that your wife has to wear niqab. I am assuming that we're talking about the hijab, the hijab which is supposed to cover her everything around that face. So the neck and what's below, the ears, the hair which comes out from here, the hair which may pop up from the front, all of that must be covered without adornment. Without all this bling bling and this glow in the dark stuff and this glittery stuff that defeats the purpose of the hijab to begin with. It's almost like a fashion show is walking by. You say, that's rough. I say, it is. It is. That's the dunya. If you would like to be in Jannah already, and you have a special shortcut, share. Otherwise, we're all in this together. Everybody has to struggle. We have our struggles. The ladies have their struggles. The children have their struggles. The parents have their struggles. Everybody has to struggle in different ways, different forms, as per Allah's wisdom. Surely, we're not wiser than Allah. Surely. To suggest that maybe a woman could have had a different type of test and maybe men could have had another type of test, that's not of our business. It is what it is. It is the wisdom of Allah. This is what makes you a believer. You submit. The sister that complains all the time, but it is hot. Yeah, and Jahannam is more hot.
Do you think because a man is wearing short sleeve, a t-shirt, he's not hot? Everybody's hot. Once it's hot, no matter what you're wearing. Excuse me, if you if you walk around with your undergarments, you will still sweat, you will still be hot. That's why they invented showers. When it's all said and done, you go shower. Otherwise, sweating is a, a common, exists common fact for everybody here. Halas. No need to whine about it all the time. And this kind of logic, you have to, you have to educate your wife about it because they complain too much sometimes. Have a lot of resistance. But how about this lady? And what about that lady? And my relatives, they don't do this. We, do, do you think on the day of judgment they're going to say, it's okay, you know, Allah, please let her to Jannah because we were like, she was following us. That's not going to fly. That's not going to work. Brothers, you have to do the homework with love, with passion. Don't bring that energy from the member to your wife by Allah's by Allah for Allah's sake, don't, don't get the same excitement and go deliver to your wife, it's not gonna be good. With gentleness, with, with ease, with calmness, with love, with affection, with some romantic words, do it however you, however you wanna do it. I love you so much, I'm jealous, I don't want any man to see you except me, ma'alish for me, do this for me, any type of thing that will get the job done. <coughs> Making sure that she understands that this is for Allah, I, again, that this is a matter of religion, it's not a matter of she does it for you and she, if, she, if you travel away from the country then she takes it all off, as some women do. These are the most evil of women. Ask Allah Azza wa to make it easy for us. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Brothers in faith The reality is Everything that I just mentioned Is dual It was done By people That were far better than us Closer to Allah and more virtuous in worse conditions than now if someone is having a hard time coping with this reality just remind them of the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tell your wives that she was preceded by the mothers of the believers who when the ayah of hijab came down they did not wait to go home or did not wait to go on a shopping spree immediately when the ayah was revealed that they must cover themselves that the hijab must be imposed and of course in the case of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, it was obligatory on them to cover their faces then they cut pieces of their garment because they used to wear overflowing garment and they could afford to cut pieces and they covered themselves with it they did not wait it was immediate implementation and guess what there were no air conditions there were no fans there were no air conditioned walls they were out in the desert imagine if you lived out there right there next to the masjid over there in the desert in the, in the sand all you had was a tent of some sort and you using the branches of trees to cover yourself and shade yourself. They didn't complain about the heat. And today we are enjoying air conditioned environments 80% of the time, 90% of the time. In the car there's an AC, in the house there's an AC, at work there's an AC, in the masjid there's an AC. The sister can't be patient for those portions of the day where there's no air conditioning or it's still hot in spite of the AC. But the mothers of the believers were able to do so. She's able. And give her another piece of information and good news. And it's actually for all of us. When the Prophet said to the Sahaba that there will come a time 
where those who adhere to Islam, because it will become so difficult to adhere to Islam, will be given the reward of 50. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, 50 of them or 50 of us? Who's us? The Sahaba. He said, 50 of you. Those who adhere to Islam in this day and time, and what's coming is worse, inshallah will be given the reward of the 50 of the Sahaba. We will never be better than them. Don't get it twisted. But in terms of reward, you will be given the reward of 50 of the Sahaba for adhering to Islam in this day and time. Tell that to your wife as well. When you guys are at home, sky's the limit. When you are within the family and the mahram, sky's the limit with modesty. But when you are outside with strangers, everything is a limit. It is not the sky. Everything is a limit. Until you are home safely. And for the women, that's already most of the job done to enter Jannah. Coupling that with fasting in the month of Ramadan and praying the five daily prayers and she doesn't pray all the time also and obeying her husband, she's good to go. Khalas. As they say, she has one foot in Jannah. She has way less responsibility than you and I have. Reminder of that as well. اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم يا مصرف القلوب اصرف قلوبنا على طاعتك ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم آت نفوسنا تقواها وزكها أنت خير من زكاها أنت وليها ومولاها وأنت على كل شيء قدير اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم تب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وتقبل منا يا رحمن يا رحيم وارض عنا وعن المسلمين وصل اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين